This conference will now be recorded. A little bit of the first half of the story of Vietnam as I know it. There are two parts. The first part is the French colonization of Indochina. And from what I have learned as I've done all this, that's where the trouble really started. <clears throat> the second one is about the American advisor area. And as of right now, we're talking about doing that two weeks from now, although that's open to uh, discussion. First, I want to share a history lesson with you. I want to describe how the French colonized Indochina all the way through their demise in 1964. And that's wrong, it's 1954. What the hell? Also, I'd like to help you understand the reluctance of the Vietnamese to see uh, us as Americans any different than what the French were. They saw us as colonizers with different uniforms. Okay, colonialism, an overview. The French Empire was different from the British Empire. The British Empire was a business-oriented empire. The state, the country of France, and the church were the organizi organizers of the French Empire. These differences were factors in the war that were fought in the 20th century. Before the French Revolution, France had colonized Canada, Louisiana, islands in the West Indies, and part of India. Then they lost Canada and India to the British. They sold the Louisiana Territory to us. And for all intents and purposes, their empire was very small. Meanwhile, <clears throat> the Catholic Church was building a foothold in Asia. The Catholic Church as I have read, was doing that because they were against Confucianism. They hated the Confucianists. The church was independent of the country, but the work that the church did did not build the bridges to the West that was expected. After the failures that I talked about in the first two points, the, Ch the French looked east. And the first thing that they did, <clears throat> Napoleon III seized Cochin, China. And by 1914, France had an empire of 4 million square miles and 60 million people. And that included all of Indochina. Now, just a little bit of, of uh, general information. What is colonialism? It's the policy of a country trying to extend its authority over other people, generally for economic exploitation. By the 15th century, European empires had been established across large areas of the world, and we didn't participate until much later in this empire building. At first, they were focused on mercantilism. Idea was to strengthen the home country economy. But then they started making agreements that restricted the colonies to trading primarily with the mother country. And that was true in America. We were restricted from who we could trade with and what we could trade with. Initial French colonization was primarily in North America. And by the 19th century, the colonial empire of France was second only to the British Empire in expanse. Christian missionaries were also active in the European controlled colonies. And if you read about the various countries in, in Africa, they were Christianized. And the same thing was going on in Asia. Okay, the French colonial empire or era actually was a cultural focus empire to begin with. They wanted to convert Indochina to the glory and civilization of France. 
Now, there were a few economic incentives, gold, silver, stones, coal, tin, and one that's not on this list that eventually became very important was rubber. Rubber was one of the primary products of Indochina. By 1843, France actually had a fleet protecting its interests in the South China Sea. And if you've ever read about the East India Company of, of England, they not only had a fleet for that company, they had warships. So these, these uh, fleets that they had involved were fairly strong militarily. But by the middle of the 19th century, France was not yet involved in, quote, affairs of state. Indochina appeared to have many riches, but it also had poverty. And, and most attractive, it had unstable governments. In other words, it was a prime target. France saw itself as a benefactor more than an opportunity upon which to capitalize. And then the question is, well, what if the people don't want to be helped? The first European settlers in Vietnam were Portuguese and Dutch. French settlers started moving in in the 18th century, and they actually helped the Vietnamese in the civil wars that followed. And then in the early 19th century, some French missionaries and Vietnamese Christians were executed. France warned the emperors of these various countries to leave their Christian subjects alone. And by 1847, they showed that they meant business by bombarding the harbor at Da Nang. And what did the Vietnamese emperor do? He responded by offering rewards for the killings of Europeans and by branding and exiling any native priest that he could find. So the Catholic Church called for a military expedition against Vietnam. In a very real sense, France went to Vietnam on a crusade. And you know how the crusades turned out. <clears throat> the first thing that they did in 1858, they subjugated Da Nang in one day. They brought in 5,000 troops in 1858. But they started having problems almost immediately. If you look over here where, where Da Nang is, it was in a country then called Anam, A-N-N-A-M. I want to talk some more about the different countries in Indochina. They then took Saigon. Saigon was a principality part of Cochin, China, that was the next thing that they took. So they were down here in the Delta. By 1861, the emperor gave in and signed away the provinces that had been captured by the French in this area and also in this area. A year later, <clears throat> A French officer forced the king of Cambodia to sign a treaty. Cambodia is here. That transferred Cambodia to France. By 1867, the governor of Saigon, <clears throat> and that was the French governor of Saigon, annexed the rest of the Mekong Delta all the way up into Cambodia. So you can see that in a period of less than a decade, the French are starting to take over what eventually became Indochina by force. Then what happened in, in the late 1860s, a French explorer went up the Mekong and found out that it was only navigable as far as Laos. However, and, and it was not good for trap for uh, commercial traffic. However, the Red River, that's the main river in the north, was suitable for commercial traffic. So then the French looked northward to Tonkin in the city of Hanoi. Now, at about the same time France was soundly defeated by the Germans in the Franco-Prussian War, 
and they didn't want to send any more manpower or money to Vietnam. However, 10 years later, they sent 250 men to Hanoi to suppress the black flags who were rebels dominating most of Tan Ken. They then voted to impose French control over Tonkin no matter what the cost. They moved an expeditionary force into the Red River Delta in 1883 and bombarded Way. The Mandarin surrendered the whole country to the French. However, <clears throat> this is 1880 now, Vietnam had just formed an anti-French alliance with China. So what Vietnam, this is up in the north, wanted to do was use the Chinese to get rid of the French. However, then what happened in 1885, the French fleet occupied several ports on the Chinese coast and told the Chinese, you either get out, okay, up in here, you either get out or you're going to wish you hadn't. The Vietnamese guerrillas in this area were now resisting, but very, very mildly compared to what came later. By 1888, Cambodia and Vietnam were made into the colony of Indochina and Laos was added labor. There were opposition movements to the French rule, but none of them were successful until World War II. The the specific territory of French Indochina was formed in 1887. It lasted until 1954. The capital of French Indochina was Hanoi. <clears throat> now, what the French did was they left ro local rulers in power, but in fact, they kept decision-making power in their own hands, and local rulers were just figureheads. French rule was completely autocratic. These are the different countries that were part of in French Indochina. Cochin, China, Tonkin, Annam, Laos, and Cambodia. The first three of these colonies, you know, we tend to think of Vietnam as a single entity, but the first three of these colonies are now the country of Vietnam, and they are very different. The country that we know of today as Vietnam was three separate countries 150 years ago. This is what the French Marines looked like in 1884. The general, colon the general colonial pattern was exploiting the resources, rice, oil, etc. They sought wealth and power and they often used force to get it. And what they were doing was they were trying to make the population like France. In other words, the, the lifestyles of the colonials were very grand, and they paid their lowest French colons higher than the upper class Vietnamese were earning. And they made slaves, or very close to slaves, on the local population. However, literacy improved. Limited schooling for all classes provided awareness of what was going on outside of Vietnam. And, and you see the same kind of problem today when people find out that other people have more than they do, they get angry. As a result, the majority of the urban population were well, well informed, but that provided the mechanism for resentment and then eventually freedom of the oppressed not like unlike the freedom movements in our country in the 18th century. The Vietnamese peasants were pretty much left alone within their village organizations. And then as needs arose for labor, they were then incorporated into the French business. They were running French plantations and being paid slave labor. On the other hand, the people in the cities lived in close association with the French, and they saw how the French treated Vietnamese citizens 
and they treated them very badly. Students and activists were arrested and sent to prison, and the prisoners who emerged survived as communists. Communism seemed the only alternative to the oppression of the democracies. In 1919, <clears throat> at the, at the uh, Versailles Treaty, Ho Chi Minh tried to have the Vietnamese people recognized and, and given autonomy. He failed. The French continued to arrest, imprison, and execute large numbers of people who didn't agree with them. The population was downtrodden. Opposition leaders were imprisoned or exiled. All that was needed was a match, and it came with the Japanese in the Second World War. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about Ho Chi Minh, also known as Uncle Ho. He has an absolutely unbelievable story. He was born in 1890. His impact in Asia was second only to that of Mao Zedong. At one time, he was a protege of Mao, but later became very independent of him. He originally was educated at a Lycee in Wei, and the Lycee is a French um, school for the intellectuals. That school was the alma mater of his disciple, Fan Dan Dong, and of Jia. It also, interestingly, was the alma mater of No Den Jim. In 1912, so at the age of 20, 22, Ho traveled to the United States and lived in New York and in Boston, where he worked in a hotel. After his failures at, at um, Versailles, he did a number of different things. By 1931, he was arrested in Hong Kong. And by in 1932, it was announced that he had died. And then the British, who were at that time in charge of Hong Kong, released him in 1933. He then made his way to Italy and from Italy to the Soviet Union. So he was getting around. In 1938, he returned to China and he served in a, as an advisor with the Red Chinese Armed Forces, the same army that eventually defeated Chiang Kai-shek. In 1940, he returned to Vietnam to lead the Viet Minh Independence Movement. He was part of a Chinese Communist mission sent to Vietnam, trained Chinese nationalist guerrilla. He oversaw many military actions against the French and the Vietnamese, I'm sorry, and the Japanese in Vietnam during World War II. He was supported by the United States OSS in his efforts. In 1944, during a reunification Congress, Chiang Kai-shek allowed Ho to, now remember, China was still nationalist at that time. Mao Zedong had a red army, but he was not in power yet. Chiang Kai-shek was the nationalist leader. He allowed Ho to accept a portfolio for the provisional government of Vietnam. Ho discarded all his communist trappings, continued to build his connections with the OSS. He focused more on the fact that he was a nationalist than that he was a communist. He issued a proclamation of independence for the Democratic Republic of Vietnam that looked an awful lot like the French and American de Declaration. That independent government was never recognized by any country. At the end of the war, there were 200,000 Chinese troops in country, 
Ho Chi Minh signed an agreement with France. Vietnam was going to be an autonomous state in the Indo-Chinese Federation and the French Union. The French did not honor the agreement that they signed. Whoops. How do I go back? Oh, well. All right, back to World War II and Indochina. When France was defeated by the Germans in 1940, Japan demanded that the French give the Japanese joint authority over control of Vietnam. When Pétain established the fascist government in Vichy, for all intents and purposes, he subordinated himself and France to the Japanese. In French Indochina, colonial authorities became Vichy French, and they collaborated with the Japanese. The French continued superficially to run affairs, but power now resided with the Japanese. And this is in 1940. Ho Chi Minh, as I said earlier, returned to Vietnam and or organized a League of the Independence of Vietnam called the Viet Minh to lead uprisings against the Japanese and the French collaborators. In July of 41, Japan got control of all vital airfield and port facilities in Vietnam. They surrounded all of the French garrisons and they forced their surrenders. And at the time, there were a large number of French troops in Vietnam. Where I was at Phu Loi, which was outside of Saigon, was a Japanese air base during the entire Second World War. And that's the field that we used with very few modifications in the war when we were there. The resources of Vietnam were used for military campaigns into Burma, into the Malay Peninsula, and India after the December 7th attacks. The airfield at Saigon was part of the support process for the attack against Malaysia, or what at that time was Malaya, and also for the attack against Singapore. I found this statement, and I think it's a very good one. Very few people know very much about what, in this country, about what went on in Vietnam from 1940 to 1945. There were no American observers in country. The French weren't going to talk about what was happening. And the reason they weren't was because much of it reflected very poorly on them. No French units fought against Allied troops in Asia. By the close of the war, there were 50,000 armed French troops in Indochina. And what they did do was they forced the Japanese to maintain a fairly large occupation force so that the French didn't get out of hand, even though, remember, that was the Vichy French. In March of 1943, Roosevelt suggested that a trusteeship be established for Indochina following the war. He did not want France to recover. Indochina. There was a split among the three trustees. Churchill did not agree. Churchill was not in favor of letting America, Great Britain, and nationalist China orchestrate what went on in Vietnam, like what happened in Korea when America and Russia were the two trustees. But this was, church, this was Roosevelt's plan. By 44, the OSS were parachuting equipment and men into country. FDR sent a memo to the Secretary of State. The U.S. should do nothing further in regard to French resistance groups in Indochina. In November, this instruction was implemented with American field commanders. So the American policy was not to support French resistance fighters it was to support Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh. 
1945, fearing that they could no longer trust the French, the Japanese interred those 50,000 men in March of 1945. Viet Minh had been very, very helpful to us. They had rescued downed American pilots. They provided intelligence to the Allies, and they occupied a pretty sizable number of Japanese troops, causing them the kinds of problems that both the French and us saw in later years. However, in Potsdam, Remember, Potsdam was 1945 in Germany. It was decided that the Chinese nationalist forces would occupy the area in northern Vietnam. The South would be administered by the British. Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnam Viet Minh got nothing at Potsdam. The Viet Minh, though, disarmed the Japanese before the Allied forces could get there. They seized power from the Japanese and Bao Dai. Bao Dai was the emperor of Vietnam in name only. And so then they welcomed the Allied forces coming in to disarm the Japanese. In 1946, elections were held in the country. It was done partially to gain recognition in the West. Almost 90% of the population voted, and the Viet Minh won 65% of the seats in the legislature. However, by now, FDR had died, and his plans all died with him. Meanwhile, the French pledged to recognize all democratic freedoms, economic autonomy, and the right to industrialize of the Viet Minh. So Ho Chi Minh signed an accord on the northern sector of the country. What it said was France recognized the Republic of Vietnam as a free state with its own government, parliament, army, and treasury. That state would be a member of the French Union. However, 15,000 French troops would be stationed north of the 16th parallel. And what happened was Charles de Gaulle returned to France and he intended to restore French rule in Indochina. So the policy of the French government was not to have North Vietnam be an independent part of the French Union. He wanted France to be in charge of everything in Indochina. Hey, George, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, what was the policy different between FDR and Truman? It, it seemed like FDR you know, was more favorable toward uh, Ho Chi Minh, and then Truman turned them off completely. Was that because Truman was closer to De Gaulle and the French? What was... No. Why did that all turn around so so different? From what I understand, FDR didn't really clearly involve Harry Truman in all of his efforts. So Truman wasn't real clear about what FDR was planning. However, they were very clear about what was going on in Europe. And when they heard that the Brits i.e. Churchill, wanted to support the French going back in, and whether or not they actually said it or not, the implication was, if you don't do that, the French will be weakened, they will be subject to communist infiltration in their own country, you'd better be more careful about what happens in Europe, and if the French want to go back into Vietnam, let them. And my understanding is that's how Harry Truman, he was, he was not, I guess I would say he was neutral. Who was telling him that? Was that the State Department? And, and the Brits. The Brits? Okay. Churchill. Yeah. 
See, what Churchill wanted to do was protect the British Empire. His, his idea of protecting the British Empire was to support the French Empire. That makes any sense. The Americans left. The Chinese were leaving. Those 200,000 Chinese troops were leaving. The Brits were leaving. The Japanese were gone. And the French were coming in in large numbers. The Viet Minh were mistaken to trust the negotiation process, and they saw their dreams evaporating. The Viet Minh at that time had roughly 50,000 troops, but they felt they could defeat the French in a short war. And the Vietnamese communists began the conflict with no resources except their vision of reestablishing their national identity. When they started, they really had a shoestring. However, the French were competent in their armored and their mechanized equipment, and they believed in the military solution. They believed their forces were too strong to resist the temptation to use them. They wanted to return to the Indochina before the Second World War. There were almost immediately incidents between the French and the Viet Minh. <clears throat> the first pitched battle was in November of 1946 over a contraband dispute, and a French cruiser began firing into Vietnamese quarters in Hai Phong. And Hai Phong, remember, was the area that was, quote, Vietnamese, Ho, Vietnamese Ho Chi Minh territory. Before we go any further, I want to tell you a little bit about Vo Yun Jap. He was the commander, and remember, he went to the same school that Ho Chi Minh went to, and the same school that that uh, No Den Jim went to. He outlived all the U.S. presidents and most prominent generals who participated in the Vietnamese wars. He died five years, seven years ago, I think. 19 2013. He was almost 100 years old. He joined a revolutionary youth group at 14. He went to the National Academy. I already talked about that. <laughs> he was expelled for organizing a student strike. He joined the Communist Party in 1931, took part in demonstrations against the French. He also assisted in founding the Democratic Front in 1933. Following World War II, he was given command of the Viet Minh military. Once the communist forces pushed the nationalists out onto Taiwan, Jap's situation improved because now he had an ally with equipment, arms, materiel, and whatnot, willing to support him. So his his position, those 50,000 men, suddenly started to look a lot stronger. Over the next seven years, his forces drove the French from most of North Vietnam's rural areas. However, they were at a stalemate. And so what he did was he attacked into Laos, hoping to draw the French into battle on the Viet Minh terms. And I'm going to get to that towards the end of the program. The Yen Ben Phu followed a year later. Okay, the French war started in 47. The Viet Minh originally controlled Hanoi, but then they withdrew because they knew they did not have the strength to combat the French on even terms. They dispersed their troops in strongholds around north of Hanoi and also in the Delta area of the Red River. The Indochina War had begun anew and it would not end for 30 years. And when you think about that, that's hard to imagine. Fighting in Hanoi was accompanied by Viet Minh uprisings throughout the country. For a while, the regional towns were occupied by the Viet Minh, even though they were small units. But by 1947, the French controlled all of the large cities, and that included 60% of the population. 
but they did not and never did control the countryside. At that time, the Viet Minh still had less than 50,000 regular troops and they had limited arms. So they focused first on building an organization. And if you ever read about Lenin, that's what he did. You start by a system and in the Viet Minh, they had 14 regions to be coordinated by a communist central committee. This was the enemy who challenged the French in 47. In 47, the French encircled these strongholds, almost led to the capture of the leadership. They almost captured Jap and Ho Chi Minh up in that area north of Hanoi, but they got away. 1948. Now, the French had a European army. Does that sound like anybody you know? Mobility and firepower. However, they were absolutely restricted to the roads, and the road network was subject to sabotage. French engineers building the transportation infrastructure were a vital element of what the French were doing. The same pattern applied 20 years later. The engineers in Vietnam, when I was there, half the captains in the Corps of Engineers were in Vietnam at any one point in time. There were no combat major combat offensive operations in 48. The French forces were spread across a large country and they were defending the cities, but that reduced their capacity for offensive action. The Viet Minh, meanwhile, <clears throat> were putting together, call it a tactical plan, sabotage, hit and run, sniping, harassment. But over time, that gets old. They also perfected a tactic that would be the hallmark of their war, ambushes. By 1948, that was a primary operation for the Viet Minh. 28 serious ambushes were carried out in 48. So what did the French do? They retaliated against the population. This was an army of occupation and they weren't wanted there. At its peak, French Union forces would not exceed 190,000 men. The puppet state of Vietnam eventually added another 150,000. But that 190,000 men was almost all combat units. They did not have the kind of logistical tail seven to one that we were accustomed to later. 49 and 50. Ambushes continued, and then they started to assault French garrisons using an artillery and heavy mortars. In late 49, a French convoy, and I've read about this convoy, was ambushed. Almost half the convoy was destroyed, and four wounded men left alive along a corridor of destruction. In January of 50, by now, Chiang Kai-shek was out in Taiwan. The People's Republic of China was now formally in charge of China, and they recognized Ho Chi Minh's government as the legal representative of the Vietnamese people. Two weeks later, the Soviet Union followed suit. 1950. People's Republic of China's advisors began assisting the Viet Minh in July of 50. By the end of the war, and this number, is, I think, is astonishing. The Viet, by the end of the war, 1954, the Viet Minh would have 450,000 men under arms. However, back to 50, the French were not ready to give up. They brought in new commanders and they implemented new tactics. Two Viet Minh divisions initiated a frontal assault against the, Viet, the French regulars, and they were running into two heavily armed regimental combat teams and lost 6,000 KIAs. 
So they were the, the Viet Minh were soundly defeated in that battle. In March of 51, another large Viet Minh force attempted to take Haiphong and suffered a bloody defeat there. In November of 51, the Viet Minh launched attacks on Saigon. The French withdrew to their main positions on the De Latre line. And during that battle, each side lost nearly 5,000 men. The war was far from over. During 52, the Viet Minh cut French supply lines, wore down the resolve of the French forces. For most of the year, though, 52, each side was getting ready for bigger operations. In late 52, the French developed something they called a hedgehog tack. And what they would do is they would set up an outpost well defended and to draw the Viet Minh out of the jungle to fight a conventional battle. The one that's shown on the right is the Battle of Na San, and they severely routed the Viet Minh in that battle. In 1953, Jap changed strategy. And what he did was decide to invade Laos, which was part of Indochina. And he came into, into Laos to surround and defeat several French outposts to get there. Now the Viet Minh was to the east of the French. And this is when they made their strategic mistake, mistake to jump into hell. They wanted the Yen Ben Phu. Huh. By 1954, the United States was actually supporting the French effort, carrying 80% of the cost of the war. On November the 20th, 1953, 1,800 paratroopers jumped into a valley 12 miles long and eight miles wide, surrounded by heavily wooded hills. The valley had a small airfield. They quickly made it serviceable, and it was soon known as hell in a very small place. What they did there, remember I told you about the hedgehog concept? They built fortifications astride the Viet Minh supply lines to draw the Viet Minh into a set piece battle. Once they had, once they had secured the airfield, they moved in 15,000 combat troops which was 10% of the French army in Vietnam. They did not believe that Jap could get his artillery. And if you, if you look on maps, this is in the middle of nowhere to this outpost. They were wrong. On March the 13th, the Viet Minh attacked the French with heavy artillery. They soon rendered the airfield unusable and within six weeks, the end came. The French were eventually overrun by huge frontal assaults. 2,200 of the 15,000 French died during the battle. 5,000 more were casualties, either wounded or missing. There were an estimated 23,000 Viet Minh casualties at the Dien Ben Phu. Almost immediately, they had already been meeting. The Geneva Conference two months later divided Vietnam at the 17th parallel. North of Vietnam would go under Ho Chi Minh, and the south, the state of Vietnam, what we call South Vietnam, was under Bao Dai. And what I want to do is tell you a little bit more of the details about Dien Bien Phu. This is what Dien Ben Phu looked like, this hedgehog. All of these green areas are fortified positions. Uh, they had different names. Dominique, Huget, Claudine, Elaine were these. Each of these <clears throat> was intended to be in, in support of each other. And you see the airfield right in the middle of it, up at the north, is Gabriel. 
The idea was they were going to draw the Viet Minh into this area to attack them. What they didn't anticipate is when they attacked, they were going to be bringing in heavy artillery. The Viet Minh brought five divisions to the area up into the north and the east. They could see, and if you look at, at, at Dien Ben Phu, this is a valley. So it's surrounded by mountains on all sides. It's kind of like the Sequatchie Valley, really. Think about putting all your troops down in the valley along the river in the Sequatchie Valley and letting the other guys have the high ground. Not exactly a good idea. These are what the central positions look like, and I'll talk a little bit more about them. It, the, the, this, is, this shows you how far apart they were. So they had 15,000 combat troops here. Almost immediately once the Viet Minh attacked, they lost this airfield. Real fighting began on the 13th with an artillery barrage concentrated on Beatrix. That was defended by a brigade of foreign legionnaires. They had made a study of Beatrice. They had rehearsed assaulting it with scale models. Within one day, Beatrix fell. 500 legionnaires were killed, 600 Viet Minh killed. On March the 14th, they started they resumed the shelling of the positions. The airstrip was closed almost immediately. And if you want to read the book, Hell in a Very Small Place, it is very, very intense what life was like in this valley. From then on, supplies were de delivered by parachute. That night, they attacked Gabriel. Gabriel is. Where, here? No. Here. They attacked Gabriel, starting with an artillery barrage. The Algerian troops were there. They abandoned it to the Viet Minh. You see the losses there. Anne Marie, these two were, developed, were defended by Thai troops. These were an ethnic minority in <clears throat> Thai. This Thai group here is not the Thai, T-H-A-I, that we know of. These were like mountain yards. They were an, an ethnic minority in the mountains. By two days, four days, they had lost three of the outposts. And so the Thais left. The, the, the troops that were out here on uh, Anne Marie withdrew to the main area. So within a week, they had lost most of their outposts, if you will. Starting the 1st of May, <clears throat> they attacked Elaine Dominique in Hugh Jet. This that's so this is this is now this is now the this is now where the French army is. That area is about 1,500 yards across and maybe 1,000 yards deep. The artillery, but their artillery was still working. They wiped out the first wave of the assault. But then later the Viet Minh detonated a mine shaft and they blew up. And within these, there actually are, this isn't a single fortification. This is a number of small different fortifications. They attacked again and overran the defenders. On May the 7th, Jap ordered an all out attack with over 25,000 Viet Minh against the 3,000 remaining defenders. The Castri radioed French headquarters in Hanoi. The Viets are everywhere. The situation is grave. The end is approaching, but we will fight to the finish. Typical French bon homme. 
By nightfall, all French central positions had been captured. The last radio transmission said that there were enemy troops outside the headquarters bunker. All positions over, overrun. Now, remember Isabel? That was the one down at the south. The garrison at Isabel was not attacked up until that point. And the garrison at Isabel broke out while the main body didn't escape the valley. About 70 troops of the Isabel fortification did escape to Laos. On May the 8th, the Viet Minh counted 11,700 prisoners, of whom more than a third were wounded. They then forced marched them 250 miles to prison camp. Only 30% of the survivors of Dien Ben Phu who were held as prisoners were repatriated four months later. So you can assume that the rest of them died either on the, on the route. I've never heard of it called a, a Batan death march equivalent. 250 miles in that area is a long way to walk when you're wounded. La guerre is finished. The French are beaten. And as I said earlier, a month, two months later, was the formal signing of the agreement between actually the Viet Minh, the South Vietnamese, I don't believe were invited to that conference. Conclusions. The French were defeated ultimately because the era of empire was gone and they didn't know it. They were, they were still living in the wrong part of the century. The people of Vietnam bitterly resented the hundred years that preceded the ultimate end of the empire. They were not supportive of white men who were there to help them. And I wonder if we had really known and understood and obviously what I did with you all was go over it pretty superficially. If we had really known and understood that's what Vietnam was like, what would we have done differently? I'd like to think we would have done some things differently. American policies missed the boat in 1945. We could have supported Ho Chi Minh. And the one we caught in 1954 was the wrong ship. And that's it. Any questions? Yeah, but George was, you know, was that ship, did you have a choice of either, the, you know, supporting the communist or, or uh, you know, the nationalist, a democracy? Because, you know, Ho Chi Minh turned out to be, a you know, a pure communist. I don't know that I, well, your choice was, support the French or support the people who were in charge of their own country. That was the choice. Well, those were the communists in charge of that country. At that time, I don't know that, that, like I said, Ho Chi Minh went way out of his way to act like he was not a communist. To act like it, but he ended up to be a communist. He ended up there because that's where he got his support from. Well, he must have been happy and, and <laughs> satisfied there. I mean, he didn't try to change, but uh, I don't know. The, the country ended up to be a communist country. It still is. You know, when you go there, Jerry, you don't get any sense of that. Yeah, I know. You just get it on the surface. You don't have to live there and be, you know, be under a communist government. So. Uh, they still, they, they can exercise, you know, American businesses are there, American corporations. Um, I, you know, I've been to China. China is a communist country too. And you can, you can, you know, travel it. And on the surface, it, it looks like it's very capitalistic and, and everything. But, you know, the communists will come down hard on you if you do something out of line. I, I think in retrospect, 
we would have done better to support the Vietnamese <coughs> running their own country personally. Well, I think that's what they tried to do. They just got the wrong puppet leaders. You know, they were trying to let give the people a chance to run their own country, but they got a couple crooks in 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 there instead. Well, that's true, but there weren't any. The other crook was Bao Dai, and if you read about him, he was the emperor, quote unquote. He spent most of his time in Italy, or on the French Riviera. So it sounds like there were there. You know, there is no good people there. <laughs> I don't think they had them. No. Yeah. Well, 